Well, good, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, my pleasure to still be on this beautiful ship. I boarded in Buenos Aires, and I don't think I'm ever going to get off. Well, maybe. I have to go home and shovel snow in upstate New York. But by the time I get there... Well, somebody might have done it instead of me, but anyway, I'm on the I'm the on the ship to uh, talk about um, oceanography, some of our destinations, and in this case tonight, the the Amazon. And um, of course, I know some of you have been here. Uh, those who are on the on the ship ship all the way up to Manaus, and so some of it is already known by those who have been here. But uh, this is one of the more remarkable parts of the world. Uh, I had the uh, adventure of my life when I was uh, 19, I hitchhiked from my home in New York all the way to Brazil. And when I was, uh, I was, of course, a deluxe vagabond at that time. And I ended up coming down the headwaters of the Amazon and uh, living with some of the natives, the Hivero and Ecuador, then um, hitching rides and canoes. And I finally ended up in Manaus back when it was a small town. So over the years, I've come back up, and I'm amazed how much of a boom town it is. And uh, it's about the in the very center of the Amazon basin. So I'm going to, tonight, I'm going to give you uh, an overview of the geography and some of the natural features of it. I'm not going to talk about the wildlife, because we have such excellent uh, scientists, naturalists aboard who specialize in that. I will give a talk in a couple of days about the native cultures, though and also talk about the uh, oceanography of the Atlantic and the Caribbean when, when we get out there. Um, I, uh, my profession is as a, I'm a sailorologist, I'll call it, uh, because I'm a, I'm a merchant marine officer with an active U.S. Coast Guard license, and I'm captain of a research vessel which is now in dry dock um, in Spain, where I hope it stays so I can enjoy this more. Um, but I know there's various of you have experience uh, sailing and in the in the wide world like this. So I, I look forward to getting to know, get to meet you and know more of your experiences. And I'll share what what I have uh, learned on my way. So just the Amazon. I hope uh, you can see the screen. I'm sorry, I have to apologize because we we just blew two projectors. I think I got a little heated in my discussion and it, it popped a couple of bulbs, but they should be back on tomorrow. So you can see this, or again, as Jim said, you can see this presentation close up on your uh, t television in your suites under the entertainment channel in case you have trouble sleeping. But uh, I'll just uh, review this area. Of course, we've come all the way up from Buenos Aires and the ship previously came around from Valparaiso all the way around, went down to Antarctica for a week, and then came all the way up the coast. We stopped at Rio and then have come around now into the center of the great um, Amazon basin. And now this is the largest tropical forest in the world and the largest river in the world. And so it, it has seven countries that share parts of it from Paraguay, Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, Venezuela, and even the Guianas, but about 60% of the whole tropical forest and the river is in Brazil. And uh, the uplands, though, in those other countries are where it gets uh, uh, beyond the head of navigation and it gets much wilder than where we are right now. So just for your factoids, this is the world's greatest river, the largest in volume and also in uh, land drained and also length, so you can read this 37 million square kilometers, gets over 2,000 millimeters, 79 inches a year on average. Many parts are dry and many parts are well drenched, especially today in Manaus. This is the rainy season, by the way, as you can tell. And then this river has a fifth of the world's fresh water that pours out into the Atlantic over 100 kilometers out into the Atlantic, it's mostly f fresh water. And when we sail out, we'll see that this uh, brackish brown water then merges, but we'll, we'll be sailing on the effluvia of the Amazon for at least a day on our way north. So the flow is tremendous, uh, three times, five times the Congo, 12 times the Mississippi. I worked on the Yangtze River for a number of years, and this, ri this river is about four times the size of the Yangtze even. And... Uh, then it's length 64, 70 kilometers, over 4,000 miles. And a ship like this can go all the way up to Iquitos, making the Amazon the most navigable stretch of any river in the world, over 2,300 miles. And then it is on a very uh, 
gradual gra elevation all the way up to Iquitos, but even so the river will flow up to two to three knots depending on how wide it is. And as we go down, you'll see that this incredible you know, power of this river is uh, something to be admired. And then the sources are up in the Peruvian highlands, and I'll just show it to you. So we have uh, different territory. The white here, rather the sort of pale, that's all the tropical forest. But there are great swamps, the Pantanal here, the higher Andes, of course, uh, the Llanos of Colombia, which are more sort of big grasslands, but they still drain into the Amazon. And then the Cerrado, or the Cerrado dry bushlands of Mato Grosso in central Brazil. But the Amazon itself has over seven major tributaries, each larger than the Mississippi. So it's draining this tremendous basin. Originally, the Amazon, before the continent split up, flowed into the early Pacific because the Amazon um, was then stopped in its primordial flow a hundred, few hundred million years ago into the Pacific by the rising of the Andes. And then at a certain point the river turned the other way and now flows into the Atlantic. Um, a curious change in its uh, course over geological history. But uh, here we are at the, near the mouth of the river and this is the, we'll be coming down and around different islands and finally up out into the ocean. But um, this is actually one big island called Marajo, which is the world's largest island in any river. It's larger than Switzerland. There are a lot of channels on the south side of it to get through, but our ship goes to the main channel out into the Atlantic. Uh, you can see the, that is not snow. Those are actually clouds in this picture. But you can see the great uh, effluvial um, sediment that's going out into the larger Atlantic. Well, here's a closer look. A few years ago, we took a seaborne ship and went through the Breves Narrows, which are too narrow for this size ship. So we actually came around and went on the no north side of Marajo and then the major uh, channels to come all the way to Manaus. Uh, I'll just show you a few places we won't get to. This is Belém, which is the biggest city in the mouth of the Amazon. Not as big as Manaus. has about a million people, but that was one of the major rubber transportment cities back over a century ago when the rubber trade made Manaus a wealthy city, also Belém, but it's a major export city nonetheless with the markets and such. We don't stop there because we'll be going north, of course, to the Caribbean. But as you get down further into the uh, river basin, you can see how wide the river is um, as it mixes with other rivers. Uh, we, now, we're up in the Rio, the ne uh, Rio Negro right here, the Black River, which is mixing with a Solomos River, which is where you have the meeting of the waters. When we depart uh, late tomorrow, we will go past that broad part of the water where the, the muddy Salamos and then the Rio Negro meet, and for miles they are two separate rivers before they finally get mixed. Uh, but as I said, we're here during the uh, rainy season, so you'll notice that uh, the clouds will gather, the humidity rises in the day. Often by midday there's a tremendous shower, and then it often will clear up by the evening. So we've, had, but we've been having some fairly clear evenings, even though the day you can go out there and get a bit of a shower. Uh, but here's just views from the bridge coming up and trying to navigate in parts of the river. Now this is remarkable because the Amazon has almost no navigation buoys. It has a few markers and a, and a few um, uh, moorings where ships will stop to tie to pick up a pilot. But we have two different sets of pilots, one from Manaus down to Santarem and then uh, from Santarem out to the mouth. But they know the, this river like the back of their hand, even though for us it's very hard to have any distinguishing features because it's from here out it's almost completely flat so it almost takes a, 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 a intuitive sense about where the channels are and often we will navigate so close to the shore where you can almost uh, uh, pick fruit from the uh, trees while there'll be a mile of river on the other side of the ship and this is because the turns of the river make the deep channel usually on the concave curve of the, f of the river bank and it can be hundreds of feet deep, whereas just nearby you'll get uh, shallows in the middle of the expanse of water that would ground the ship. Well, anyway, we're in good hands and we have uh, the best of the pilots aboard. But what you'll see as we leave Manaus is that there'll be a lot of small settlements. 
and the the people in the lower Amazon are uh, some a lot of them come to Manaus, which is a major industrial center, and uh, uh, the Brazilian government has tried to make this the big city of northern Brazil uh, for economic reasons and also to have a, a major population in this part of the Amazon. But the rest of the Amazon, there's a very thin population, the remnant of various uh, native peoples that I'll talk about in a few days. But what we see in this part of uh, of the Amazon are what they call the caboclos or the riverianos, uh, which are the mixed breed, part uh, native, part Portuguese, part who knows uh, who have lost any of their indigenous languages. They speak a kind of Portuguese, however difficult it is for even uh, uh, people from Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro to under understand them. And they live a subsistence existence along the riverbanks, fishing, gathering fruit, tapping rubber in the wild rubber trees, and uh, often not going to school. Uh, they, and also they're nominally Catholic, so you'll see in places there'll be uh, uh, small settlements with a church, but they don't have any priests. They have lay teachers in these places. And then these kind of wooden boats, as you saw out in um, the docks here in Manaus, are the transportation system all through the vast network of all these rivers. So to have a boat like that means you can uh, fill it up with, here's some lumber products or fruit or things they grow in their um, personal gardens. And so this is the life of the river. And these people usually don't go anywhere and they know nothing better. And usually their children have no education. They just continue this subsistence living on the river, which gives them everything they need. Well, I've been a river specialist. And by the way, my sister is here, Mimi, who is a river guide on the Colorado River and a boat builder by profession. And so she appreciates the, the curl and the sort of the sensu sensuous nature of river waters versus the, the flow of the ocean, which is a different uh, kind of uh, existence. But you'll, you'll see this, and you'll be on deck the next few days and see the kind of the gentleness of the river uh, out here and the, the quality of the water. Now, we are, of course, coming from Manaus, the meeting of the rivers, the Salamos, the major tributary. And from here on down, it's called the Amazon. And I'll go into the origin of that in a minute. But then we go to uh, Paratim, Santarem, uh, Gorajo up here, and then we'll go on out and go to the north. But this is the vast delta region where there's a lot of flooded areas. Now the rainy season is upon us. It's rising. It's flooding all of these floodplains. In Manaus alone, the wa water rise between the height of the rainy season and the depth of the dry season is over 10 meters, so 50 feet of rise where we are. And the dock where we are is on a, one of the world's biggest floating barges. So it goes up and down, has bridgeways. This was built in Scotland and towed over here back over maybe about 100 years ago now as how you can have a, a, a functional dock in the river because otherwise it's a pretty steep climb in the dry season. So you'll see this uh, just outside of Manaus. It turns into all semi-virgin uh, forest because a lot of it was cut right along the river for building boats and things like that, but it, a lot of it grows back in fairly quickly in the, in the tropical climate. But you'll see these vast grasslands and flooded areas that they call uh, uh, razea in uh, Portuguese, caboclo, the local native term. And as we go down, uh, it, it just seems to go on forever. So don't think you have to stay on deck to see everything because uh, it's like taking the Trans-Siberian Railroad. You get used to the trees. And, uh, but the sky gets fantastic. Now, in the dry season, it's very clear and very hot. But in the rainy season, like now, you get these tremendous amounts of humidity that rise up, and then they'll create tremendous storms and dramatic uh, seascape or riverscapes, I should say. And this is the meeting of the waters. So you see the, the Samaus with the silt coming from the Andes matched by the tannic, acidic water of the Rio Negro. Um, this comes from the upper lands to the north, which have a quality of uh, releasing a lot of vegetation um, into the water that gives it that dark color. And then further down again, you have the flooded, um, endless floodplains of the lower Amazon, um, where what was a kind of a pasture land and a dry land suddenly becomes a lake. And this time of year, you take a boat out in that area, the wildlife gets out of the 
dry lands and then they go up into the trees. So this time of year it's good for going out on a small craft and you'll see the monkeys and the birds all sort of stranded in the trees. I mean, they're all right, but uh, it, in the dry season you can't even get to some of these places. We are near what's called the, the uh, uh, Anavilias uh, National Park, which is the world's biggest freshwater estuary with hundreds of islands for stretching for about 200 miles upriver. And this is one of the national parks they made in Brazil to try to preserve this part of the um, Amazon area compared to the, let's say, the development you see in Manaus. So it's just vast and continues on and on. Now, further upriver, a lot of the tributaries turn into, oh, uh, let's say, meandering streams through the forest. And um, again, if you don't have a canoe, you will not be able to get them, but get anywhere. But often they have oxbow lakes and remnant um, uh, parts of the channel that were cut off by flood or just the natural erosion of the, the banks. So then you have these uh, r remnant parts of the river that then get filled in finally with silt and they grow up and they create sort of patches of former river. Like this was once a cut through like there. But of course you can imagine if you're paddling your way there for a long time, as one poet said, when you're paddling a canoe, you wish you were a bird because you could just fly right over it, let's say. And so parts of the Amazon, I mean, this is a changing ecology, which I'll get to more to, but whatever you think it is, is often going to, within so many years, it, the channel might have changed, the, the land will have a different quality because the river moved away. And then when you get up into the upper Amazon, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, suddenly it gets very steep and hilly. And this is the most um, virgin part of the whole Amazon Basin, but just because of the topography and where it falls out of mountains that are up to 20,000 feet high down into the lowlands in this incredible cataracts and r uh, jagged um, landscape that is almost impass impassable until r new roads are cut through, but particularly the airplane has made it possible people fly in and then they can have some contact in this area. And I myself went through the Marañón area, came up Ecuador, down this street, all the way down to Iquitos, Peru. Uh, it took me over a month to do, do a trip that was maybe 500 miles. And I got stuck in a Hivero village because the rapids were so strong that they never went down there. But they sent word back upriver and then a Ecuadorian military um, boat came, which was a high-powered speedboat, and then they uh, took me out of my uh, comfort in the village where I went hunting for, uh, with blowguns for monkeys every day with the men, and then we ate uh, manioc, avocados, and monkey meat every day. And I could have stayed there and had a perfectly pleasant life, but they said, no, you're not allowed to be here. You're probably a Peruvian spy or something like that. And so they rowed me down the river, bounding through this uh, tremendous rapids to go through the last range of mountains in a, in a canyon they call the Boca Maria, the mouth of Mary, just as a prayer to get through alive. And then after that, the river suddenly was flat, and I continued it on other boats all the way down to Iquitos. Well, this is what it looks like up there. You have uh, the forest turns into deciduous trees and then finally into a cloud forest where it's always enveloped in mist and a completely different ecology. And very few people are anywhere there in those mountains because they're just so rugged. There's no agriculture. Uh, maybe some of you have been to Machu Picchu. This is the Urbampa River. And you know that river flows north out of Peru from near Cusco and they have that train that goes there and if you've been there you realize how impassable these mountains have been for so long and then they have these cloud forests with the trees covered in moss and amazingly the Incans cut roads and laid stone to make a walkways oh only maybe two meters wide to go through the mountains to get to Machu Picchu and other sites in this area and uh, back then, we actually chopped our way through by, by land, hiking for a couple of weeks to get to Machu Picchu on the old Incan Highway. Well, then if you go up to Ecuador and then to Colombia, this is similar. The very high mountains then pre precipitate the water. Now, the weather comes from the east and drops water on the eastern slope of the Andes. You go right over these mountains, and then you have often a desert, particularly in Peru. But the furthest source of the Amazon is said to be at Mount Mizbi or Huanga, they also they call it in Quechua, and that's the farthest source 
as has been so far identified. Of course, there's you know, a thousand other streams that are feeding the great river system. This is the point where there's a bit of glacial melt on top of a cliff on uh, Mismi. And then there's Bolivia with a great plain in the Gran Chaco, which is again a, a grasslands mostly. And they flow north, the, the streams flow north, and then the, the jungle is more further north. But you can see the development of some of the Brazilian towns. And now there's the trans Amazonal highway across to this area. There's also a natural gas pipeline that goes from Brazil to Peru. And now Br Brazil is exporting natural gas from a Peruvian port. There's also a plan to build a, a railroad except that that's so challenging in engineering how to get a railroad built over these mountains that has yet to be built, even with the, uh, the Chinese. But that's in the planning, so that they don't have to ship all the produce on, out of eastern Brazil. Then you go further north into the Llanos of Colombia and Venezuela. And again, that's mostly grasslands. And then you get other uh, cordilleras and uh, remnants of the Andes up into the Caribbean Sea. And that's where the Orinoco River Valley is, right next to parts of the Amazon. It's also where they have the, they have the uh, Cerrado, these great mesas uh, and uh, high flat peaks that have their own ecosystem up on the top, most famously at Angel Falls. Now this is drains into the Amazon and part of it drains in the Orinoco, but this is a sort of a place of great mythology and also some science. Uh, I think it was The Lost World by the British author Doyle, Arthur Doyle, Arthur Doyle, you, you've read the book. Anyway, this, 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 uh, the world's greatest waterfall over 967 meters high, that's almost 3,000 feet high, was discovered by an American aviator named Jimmy Angel and uh, he shyly named it after himself, not who he thought he was in the sky. But this is again a national park in Venezuela, tremendous cataract. I've uh, that's some place I don't really want to take a shower, though. And then there are these all these other national parks up here in the Cateca. This is Iquitos here, Leticia, uh, where Peru and Colombia uh, meet, and they sh they share a border right there. But this is where this black water comes out of the uplands and is uh, the source for the Rio Negro where we are today. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the discoveries and the first adventurers here. Um, the mouth of the river was discovered by uh, Vincenzo Pinzon in 1499, and he called it the Rio Mar, because when you come into the Amazon from the Atlantic Ocean, it's so vast that they called it the River Ocean, because they realized it was a river, but it was as big as any sea they'd ever seen. And they met some of the Guarani people, and they had initial trading, but then they had some fighting with the natives. And then, of course, the... Uh, uh, the name Amazonas comes from the mythology about the women warriors. And uh, this was not perhaps true here, but the word got back to Europe. And of course, this was a, a legend from Greek times about a, a kingdom of women on the Black Sea, actually. But here they depicted the Amazon women from now Brazil, here having a hot date. So see this guy? He's getting slowly cooked. Anyway, careful, who, careful with the natives, as they politely say to the sailors here. But um, then the conquistadores from Spain, from Peru, came over the Andes looking for more gold. And you know Pizarro, who famously tortured and murdered the Incan king for a room full of gold. Well, they kept hearing that there was more over the mountains, and so maybe they were led astray to put up an expedition to find El Dorado, the, the mythical Indian king who had so much gold that he adorned himself with it every day with gold dust. Now, again, this was probably a, a tall tale that the natives told, but um, Pizarro sent Oriana and Aguirre, the two uh, lieutenants of his, to go over the mountains and then find El Dorado. And they were the first Europeans to travel the length of the Amazon all the way down to the mouth. And Aguirre went up and came up the Orinoco and came all the way back. They left with 300 armored Spanish, 2,000 bearers, hundreds of horses and pigs and things. So they had this giant expedition. Of course, they went over the Andes, which is unbelievable to carry all that gear. And they even had natives to carry them, what they call the caballitos, the little horses, being humans to bear, bear them over. And, of course, they faced the kind of streams and mountains that are still there. But they persisted. It took them over two and a half years to do this whole trip. Here they are, ferrying horses across one of the streams. 
They came to places that the natives said, well, El Dorado is just down the river down here. This is one lake they visited and drew this picture of a a tremendous lake uh, that's now in Colombia. But they never found gold. They did find the Amazon forest, though. And so these are illustrations later of just the size of the trees and the expanse of the land. And they just couldn't quite believe that there was such a vast place with uh, a, such a tropical forest. They had never seen such a thing. They were over in Peru, which is much more uh, temperate in a sense. Or, but they then fanned out and they discovered a lot of the rivers and they wrote the first uh, descriptions of, for instance, the giant Victoria lily pads and some of the animals like the giant came on. They've been measured up to 35 feet and not, not meant for wrestling, but... Uh, uh, then they set up their first um, settlements. Um, they, uh, they tried to claim this in the name of Spain, so they put up small towns. This is Iquitos in Peru, and in 1750, there was an agreement between the um, Spanish and the Portuguese that this would be Portuguese territory to that point in, in, on the river, which remains to this day. That's the first town of uh, Peru. Uh, later, the Brazilians especially came into the Amazon with what they call the Bandeiras, uh, to go hunting for the natives to make them slaves on the po- plantations in eastern Brazil. And so what were generally peaceful people were suddenly rounded up and enslaved or killed. And this became a terrible part of the history of the Amazon with various of uh, the Europeans coming in and just uh, treating the natives uh, as subhumans and putting them to work. And then the Jesuits came in to missionize and uh, they had conflict with the slave uh, runners and some of the plantation owners. This father, uh, Vieira, was uh, famous for advocating for the rights of the native peoples, which got him in a lot of trouble with the bandieras and the other Brazilians in particular. At one point, a whole group of bandieras attacked one of the Jesuit settlements and killed the, the priests and drove them away to the point where the kingdom of Brazil at the time banned the Jesuits. Now you can see this in the movie, uh, Werner Herzog movie of uh, The Mission, which is a pretty uh, pungent tale of this time where the, the conscience of the, uh, the Christian church was actually driven out so that the uh, settlers could have their way. Well, they did continue to set up little towns like this, Sao uh, Joaquim uh, on the Rio Branco. They did uh, convert the natives and set up churches and small settlements, but a lot of them actually faded away in short time. This is the now the site of that one of the original settlements in the Rio Branco, but once it was abandoned, immediately the, the jungle took over again. And of course, now there are many more people coming back. But back in those days, this was so wild that people would come in and would just literally disappear and many uh, adventure came, and only a few got to live the tale. Um, most famously, uh, the, the Portuguese wouldn't let any other Europeans come into their territory, not even the Spanish, but they finally agreed to allow a few uh, philosoph scientists, this one particularly Charles de la Codemine uh, from France, who was sent uh, by, by the king of France to measure the equator to try to get a better sense of the size of the earth. So he traveled and wrote a full account. Then came various German explorers of Spitz and Maritz, who then were more interested in the native customs and began, let's say, the anthropology of it rather than just the exploitation. Then they were followed by Humboldt, the great explorer, in 1800, who was not allowed by the Portuguese in, but he, so he came via Venezuela and, and, uh, via the Spanish permission, and he was the first one to come up to an area on the upper Rio Negro, which is called the Casquieri Canal, where there's a there's a stretch of river that is in the highland, and at rainy season it will flow into both rivers, the Orinoco and the Amazon. And that for thousands of years was known by the natives that they could take canoes and get up here and then go down to Venezuela, or you could come up from Venezuela go down to the Amazon. And that's still there as a natural phenomenon, one of the few places in the world where you have a, a river that connects, or rather a high tributary that connects two other major rivers. Then you had other explorers, on, uh, and Steinem, again, uh, now scientists who were interested in the people. They would transcribe the language and try to get a, understand how these people lived in the tropics. Came many naturalists, like uh, uh, Bates, who was in first of the, or, uh, the, the bird watchers and ornithologists, uh, uh, to come into the Amazon, which is in itself a fantastic uh, array. And, and our naturalists from the Ventures team will show you a lot more about that wildlife. Uh, Arthur uh, Russell Wallace came, who was also a uh, biologist, and he was famous for 
his work in Asia, but he also came to the Amazon and wrote quite a bit. Uh, this guy, Richard Bruce, Spruce, or he collected for um, the British Museum. And so this is where science came to the Amazon, really interested in the natural life and the, um, and the human life in the, in the whole region. This is one of Spence's drawings, of course, all before photography. And then came the, the American Hiram Bingham, who famously went over the mountains and discovered Machu Picchu. And so the whole area became better and better known to the point where even Teddy Roosevelt, when he retired as president, what does he do? Goes out hunting and exploring um, and led an expedition with Candido Rodon to the, uh, the, the River of Doubt, they called it. And there's a very good book that's about that expedition of, of Roosevelt and his son Kermit. But as happened in those days... Uh, the outsiders caught malaria that uh, many of the natives are, are not susceptible to or they're immune to it. And this led to Roosevelt's premature death from this expedition where they came f up from the Mato Grosso then up to what's now the Rio Roosevelt. They named it after him. Finally, this had been an unexplored part of the river system. And of course, they came all the way down to Manaus back there in about 19, 1911, I believe the expedition was. And it was followed by the famous Colonel Fawcett, who was a British Army officer who believed that they were ruins of advanced civilization in parts of the uh, Amazon basin. And he was uh, quite an uh, exorbitant character, and he insisted that he heard tales of, uh, of uh, r the ruins of, again, ancient civilizations. And so he led, he, he and his pack, up into the areas up to um, Amapá, which is near the north side of the major outlet of the Amazon, where he disappeared. And so there's been a mystery for years of what happened to him. Now there's a book called The Lost City of Z, which is a bestseller if anybody's seen that, which recounts his explorations and some of the memory of the local natives about his trip. <coughs> then there's the, um, the biologist uh, Richard Evans Schutz, who was um, a Harvard University scientist who came and spent many years studying the pharmacology and herbal uh, knowledge of the natives. And, uh, and he, he worked actually in researching rubber, but on the side he wrote scientific papers about the, uh, the uh, practices of the natives again. Betty Maggers, who was an uh, ornithologist again. So these people led the way for what we will see now and no more. Oh, well, but watch out for this scientist. He's hungry. And I should say... Uh, you know, people are worried about malaria and mosquito bites and Zika and all these things. Right where we are, there are no mosquitoes because the Rio Negro is too acid for them. Further down river there are, but um, you'll get the warning from the bridge about closing your balcony windows and they, they screen off the intakes on the ship. So on our way up here, we had no problem. And while you're out moving on the river, it's no problem. If you go out and camp in the, the, the hinterland, you might have trouble, especially with these hungry little fish. But there are other hazards, I should show this one. Uh, this is called the kissing bug or the assassin bug, Rodinius prolixus, and which I'm, I'm sorry to say it bit me when I was camping in the upper Amazon. And what it does, it walks around in a, in a hut and drops on you, and then it likes to bite you in the, in the face. And this is a common problem uh, for foreigners. Now, again, most of the purebred natives are have uh, become uh, immune to it, but it gives you a kind of a bacterium that uh, then gives you heart problems. And it was finally discovered by um, the, the, the actual uh, virology of it. it was studied by this Carlos Chagas, and it's called the disease is called Chagas, and it creates severe heart failure. And if you don't, if you don't die from the initial fever, it becomes a remnant in you. And I myself got. Uh, a ventricular fibrillation from this many years later. Is there any cardiologist in the house? I'm, I, I'm late for my checkup. Well, it almost killed me for a number of times. Many, many times I finally had a defibrillator implanted and then the condition went away. So if, you, if it doesn't kill you, then, then it just is gone. So now I feel comfortable. I'm probably immune to it and uh, it won't get me yet. But uh, meanwhile, those are the kind of dangers that the uh, Amazon has for particularly the explorers and those who come into it to stay and live. Uh, this is the famous Orlando Boas and his brother, Fernando, who, who came out to represent the Brazilian government to try to um, make peace with any of the natives who were resisting uh, contact. And so particularly he was interested in 
why these people can live in this environment and have almost no cancer, no heart problems. Um, they live a fairly long life, usually accidental drowning or else warfare was their cause of death. But what they did succumb to were outside diseases, the flu, the smallpox, cholera, all those things were brought in and they decimated the local populations. And so Boaz and his um, compatriots tried to uh, protect the native peoples from the contact with foreign um, diseases and also incursions on their land. Now, again, I'll talk about that in more detail in a few days. But meanwhile, what's going on now is the f completion of the Trans-Amazon Highway, which stretches for over 2,500 miles from uh, Belém all the way to the Peruvian border. And then it hasn't gone over the Andes. It just fits into the local roads of Peru. And it, what it has done is open up room for settlers and the Brazil government has had a kind of a homestead act. If you go in and you clear land and set up a house then you can get title. So for the last number of decades there's been a land rush that follows the bulldozers to create new settlements all through particularly the southern Amazon. So the other um, famous Brazilian who tried to moderate this incursion into the Amazon was Chico Mendez who was a representative for the wild rubber ta tappers. In 1988 he was murdered by some people that were never indicted and he became the first uh, sort of ecological uh, martyr for Brazil. Um, though the development goes on because between the the airplane, the bulldozer and the chainsaw there's a great deal of uh, destruction going on in the Amazon now and it's a continuing uh, crisis and uh, uh, one of the uh, the naturalist Cairo will talk much more in detail about this but I'll just show you what goes on the virgin forest gets cut for the timber but particularly to deforest it um, for agriculture but the wood is out and then the land is burnt and then stripped of all of its uh, uh, wildlife and all and then raised uh, for soybean or cattle ranching and so this is chewed up maybe already 15 to 20 percent of the old rainforest and uh, you can see if, as you particularly go to the southern side of the Amazon it's always burning. Um, just in the last year they said they from satellite they counted over 18,000 fires during the dry season just burning slowly through the forest usually set by people because they clear the land uh, and then they plant uh, either grasses for the cattle or, and or the big crop now is soybeans. But this kind of destruction is, of course, a, um, a, a great tragedy because what happens, the whole area turns into a desert. And you get a few crops out of it, and then they move on and cut down more forest because there's very little soil, and it, it washes away. And then when the sun gets on it with no uh, cover of the forest, the soil actually bakes and becomes as hard as a brick. And so then it's useless. And so this is... Uh, an ongoing uh, problem of Brazil. They keep saying that it's getting uh, moderated and not so bad, but actually it goes on anyway. And so particularly the cattle grazing is, is particularly uh, destructive because uh, the cows eat up everything and then they again they have to move on because it turns into a desert. So, but it's a tough life and they have uh, uh, a lot of pressure to have employment and then of course the Brazilians eat a lot of beef but a lot of it gets exported and uh, so at your basic fast food restaurant in the north it's usually Brazilian beef. But the soybean is the big cash crop now that uh, and uh, uh, some sugar cane is grown and so when they begin to clear and grow that again the soil is depleted and then it is exhausted uh, but the people are tough, they just keep going after it. And again, the homesteading policies of the Brazilian government has meant a lot of displaced poor from the, the ever more dry central Brazil are moving into the Amazon, get their own land. Um, and this is a, a, a social problem. Most of uh, the, the land, over 55% of the land in Brazil is owned by 1% of the elite. And so these are usually landless peasants who come to the Amazon just to get a little track and then they raise their family and then they keep moving into the forest for uh, their sustenance. The other problem in the Amazon is the Brazilian government's plan to dam many of the rivers. And this has flooded a lot of forests, displaced native people and led to the collapse of some of the upper river systems. They have yet to build a dam on the main Amazon, it's just too big. So there are 
many, many dams in the upper areas on both south and north side of the main uh, flow of the Amazon. But again, it, it demolishes the forest. You see here some of the dams are being built. And because Brazil takes over 60% of its elect electricity from hydroelectric power. Now that they've found a lot of oil and natural gas off the coast, um, they're probably going to be using that more. But one of the problems with all these dams is that once they've been built, they often silt up or else they cause a lingering drought in that particular part. And so then they don't actually produce the electricity that they were built for. The other problem is the transmission from such great distances to the big cities in the south means they lose a lot of the power. And so somebody was on the ship, the other uh, crews, who was brought in to build natural gas generators outside of Sao Paulo because they could not get enough electricity out of the new dams built so far away, a thousand miles away in the Amazon. The other problem are the mining uh, interests. There are big iron ore mines on the north side. There are a lot of gold placer, um, small claim, and... Uh, illegal dams uh, on the lower Amazon and of course what that does is it puts mercury into the river and cyanide and poisons the fish life. And also up in the upper Amazon they've had a lot of oil exploration. Chevron up in the upper Ecuadorian region finally had an international suit. They had to pay uh, damages to the Ecuadorian government for polluting vast stretches of the upper uh, Marañón River. And then you have all the settlers. Um, they estimate there may have been five million natives in all of the Amazon uh, basin before contact. Now there are only about 200,000 left. But now there are about 24 million Brazilians and other nationalities living in the industrial sites and in the big cities that is like we just are in. And so this is where the Amazon keeps getting chewed away at and developed. And, you know, some people do quite well. They have their life. But the damage to the environment is uh, unbelievable. Here's the last little remnant of the upper forest in the foothills of Peru. It's all been cut for timber and now of course it's running silt down the river and uh, turning the area into a desert. So these are the some of the graphs of just what's going on. The um, untouched forest is maybe 80, 75 percent with the red areas are the recent deforestation and what this has done is meant that whole area now doesn't get as much rainfall and each area is under a different state of the 26 states of Brazil. Often they have different local policies that the federal government uh, can't quite control, especially on the Rodonia and the Bolivian side down here. That's the latest part of this sort of vast uh, deforestation that's going on. And the numbers are often inaccurate, but you can see it quite clearly from aerial and satellite uh, 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 sensing of this whole area. So international organizations are watching this, often not believing what the Brazilian government says. So one of the laws that Brasilia passed was that 20% of any new agricultural land has to be left for. So they leave these little islands of, of the woods surrounded by soybeans, but these islands are unsustainable. There's no habitat for very much in there, maybe some bugs, a few birds, but all the larger animals are gone. And then eventually they cut them down for, you know, just to have a little more crop. So this is uh, the most serious problem in the Amazon basin, the cattle ranching, the agriculture, the timbering, the mining. And so it uh, continues on and, you know, within our lifetimes, maybe another half of it will be gone. They say within 150 years, the whole Amazon may be just a national park remnants in an island of development and, and population. And the Brazilian government is always uh, at odds with its own self over what to do. Meanwhile, illegal log logging goes on, often under the auspices of the authorities that are sent to, to protect it. But the Brazilians have a very strong attitude, even with uh, the former president Lula da Silva, that, that the international community and outside environmentalists and concerned people should not tell Brazil what to do. And there was a, a saying that he had that Amazonia is a nossa. That means the Amazon is ours and it's ours to decide and use as a national resource. But uh, some international groups have come to the point where they actually send in um, money to buy up land. So particularly the Norwegian National Sovereign Fund has sent over a billion dollars just to buy critical parts of the Amazon that have been identified they should not be um, uh, developed and impacted. 
Well, anyway, I'll go back to just the people. This is a typical village like you'll have outside of Manaus. You can go on a tour from here, Santa Rem, the other places, and you'll just see that even so, this is a tremendous uh, place with the, even if it's a second growth forest, there's still this life that happens all through all these rivers that uh, is sort of uh, relaxed and charming and friendly. I mean, the Brazilians are naturally a, an outgoing and friendly people, and, uh, but they have a very poor life if you count it in material substances. Um, this little village where we went uh, did have a little generator. They're off the grid completely, but they ran the generator every day so they could listen to the radio or have their TV on or have their phones charged and have their internet. So even in the most remote places now, they all realize that the world is far bigger than even the Amazon. So this woman and her family were in a field growing manioc and papaya, mangoes, and the staple is manioc or cassava, yucca, many names for it. That's the um, crop of the Amazon, which is a tuber that you have to clean and wash um, to eat. The other great gifts of the Amazon are chili pe uh, peppers and also uh, tobacco and also cacao of chocolate. So what would the world do without these crops from the Amazon? So I just uh, took a picture of this little kid in this village who, who looked up as like we were the first explorers to ever come from another continent to come see him. And so, you know, you can see in the eyes of these children out in these little villages that, you know, their life will be probably transformed in ways uh, that we don't even know as the changes continue or they may move to Manaus and uh, uh, have an industrial urban life. Um, but... Uh, Here's the symbol of Brazil. This is actually a picture I took uh, yesterday on that uh, customs building right off the dock. And so the, the pride of the Brazilians is expressed in their presence in the Amazon, I'd say. And so you come to a city like Manaus, which I remember as a little colonial leftover town of once upon a time, and you have tremendous development right here, which is probably going to go on. And just a few years ago, they opened the first bridge across the Amazon. We can see out on the deck up here, which is the uh, Rio Negro, Ponte Rio Negro, that goes for uh, three kilometers across to the other side where there's nothing. And there's no road to anywhere. But that's sort of like the ultimate Brazilian bridge to nowhere. But it is the symbol of the future of the Amazon for better and for worse. And so I hope you can appreciate this fantastic place uh, and, uh, you know, understand some of its problems and appreciate the resilience of this ecosystem and the people. With that, I wish you a great trip and look forward to meeting you personally and bon viagem, as they say in, in Brazil. Thank you very much. <laughs>